The Financial Procast, episode 60. Whole life insurance versus universal life insurance. Financial resources you can use from professionals you can trust. This is the Financial Procast. Web hosting for the Financial Procast is brought to you by the Insurance Pro Blog, where insurance gets demystified. Online at theinsuranceproblog.com. Additional promotional considerations brought to you by the Solis Agency. Safety, security, prosperity. Online at solusagency.com. Hello and welcome. This is the Financial Procast. It is Wednesday, October 23rd, 2013. Episode 60 has arrived. I am Brandon Roberts. And I'm Brantley Whitley. And, uh... Skype willing, we will record a podcast today. Skype is uh, is a continual weak link in our operation here at the Financial Procast. Yes, yes it is. Although, it is free, so yes, kind of hard to and complain about. With cold weather among us, we may have to do more of those sitting in the same room podcasts. On from, site? Uh, yeah. From May. <clears throat> on location? Yep. Yeah, <laughs> on location well. for one of us. <laughs> exactly. So, uh, So what are we getting into today? Today we're gonna we're gonna do something that we probably should have done like I don't know a year ago episodes ago <laughs> yeah um which is a a topic that we get asked quite and we have talked about kind of very indirectly it's it's kind of embarrassing for us to sit here and be like yeah you know we've never really done this side by side on either the financial procast or the insurance pro blog so yeah we've uh not not done a, a fair comparison uh, of the two products before. Those two products being universal life insurance and whole life insurance. Yeah. We should, we should bring that up. Um, before we, get, before we get into talking about those products, <laughs> what were those two products again? Yeah. Yeah. Well, there was the whole intro. Hedge funds and annuities. That's what we're talking about. That's next week. <laughs> yeah. Um, so the, the conundrum that we deal with on a pretty frequent basis are the people who have a book, um, won't name names, although we've done it in the past, and they will will come to us and they'll it could ask be, It could about, be a couple of different books, actually. but Yes, it could be. Um, and they come to us and they ask us about design and they ask us to help with design and being equal opportunity individuals, we're happy to talk about both products. And the, the issue is people will go, well, I like the way that one performed, but um, I was always told that I should always buy the other one. So what should I do? Meaning, meaning that the book said, don't ever buy that universal life stuff because whole life insurance is the only way to go. Correct. That's, that's usually the way it, it that the direction that it goes. That's, like, that's 99.9%. <laughs> yeah. And, and I will admit, um, I don't know if you're going to admit on the podcast, even though I'm now calling you out on it, that uh, I was in that camp at one time in my life. That whole life insurance was the only product that yeah. anyone should ever buy. Well, because all the other insurance. stuff is just a ripoff. And universal life insurance is what companies sold to, to screw their clients? Yep. That wouldn't have anything to do with mutual upbringing, would it? It might. Yeah. Yeah. They weren't so quiet about that. No. No. Quiet about a lot of other things. Yeah, um, like when you said, "How come this one performs better?" Shut up. Um, How come you charge me ten cents for a sheet of paper? Yeah. <laughs> um, so, yeah, let me ask you a question: Is one better than the other? No. Really? Nope. Why not? Um, because I'm going to give you my cop out answer. Okay. It depends. Why? Well, it depends on the situation. On um, what? Well, it depends on the age of the client. It depends on what the goal is. It depends on how much money they're uh, wanting to uh, commit to the plan. It depends on how long they want to commit to the plan. Um, there are a lot of there's a lot of variables there. Mm -hmm. um, sometimes the math just doesn't work one way or the other. I see. Uh, and and there's a clear. I will, I will say this, that most times there is a clear winner, um, but it really, whether one product wins or loses really depends on what the client's objective is. In other words, you could have two people side, you could have, you know, Bob and 
Jane, right? And Bob and Jane come out with almost identical results. One, you know, if we compare whole life and universal life for both of them, but Bob chooses whole life because he has a different objective and Jane chooses the UL policy because she has a different objective than Bob does. So it just depends. There's no, in the, I don't know how many, uh, proposals and, and or case presentations we've generated in the last, uh, almost two years now, quite a few hundred, yeah. hundred, probably quite a few hundred. Um, mm -hmm. it's, it, it really just depends on what it is that you're trying to accomplish. And I know that okay. I hate saying that cause it sounds like such a cop out, but it, it's, it's just not answer. You got to be holistic about the process. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> but it really does. It's not, it's, it's not, it's not a matter of which one is better. It's which one is better for you. Oh, um, uh, so to be fair, even though we've said it, it, it tends to follow one direction. It's the whole life hacks just categorically denying that there is any benefit to owning universal life insurance. There are those on the opposite side of the, the aisle who will kind of do the same thing. Yeah, there are, but you know what the problem with those people is? They don't understand whole life insurance. There you at all. go. If I had a, I wish I need a ding, ding, ding button. <laughs> well, I need more sound effects we, on, the, on the board well, here. But yeah, they, they, the, the universal, most of the people, I can't say all of them, most of the people who we've encountered who are pro um, UL, and, and I'm putting uh, Ball really, when you really. Try to explain it to them? Well, really, you should say, we should probably say index universal life because that's really what is out there nowadays that's mostly yep. competitive. Um, yep. There's really not anything that's competitive in the current assumption um, universal life space anymore. Um, Which for the for the non oh um, yeah we should clarify that professional as well. home gamers that that is simply a fixed declared interest rate every day rather than an index excuse me an interest rate that's dependent on an index movement right um, but typically the pe the detractors to whole life insurance don't don't understand whole life insurance well enough to explain why it would be not be good can't we say the same thing about the opposite side of the the coin though yeah okay. But I thought we'd already covered that. <laughs> so, no, no, absolutely. Absolutely. Uh, are you kidding? I mean, every bit of education I had in this business for the first, you know, three years I was in the business was about, you We know, don't know how it works. We just know it's bad. Yeah. Don't worry about that. It was, uh -huh. it's, it was a bad, it was an invention. Just like you said in the beginning for, for second tier life insurance companies to rip <laughs> off customers. Yep. So you don't need to worry about it. We don't have one, except we do. But we don't want to talk about the fact that we have one. <laughs> we made it really bad so we could compare it and say. <laughs> we made it. We well, actually, we we have one we've had for years, but we only made it available to really, really, really rich people. Right. Um Because it actually does work, and we're not going to pull it out unless we have to. Because you know we don't make as much money. No. Anyway. Um, uh, that was probably a lot of obscurity and rambling there in the first 10 minutes, but yeah, good job with that. Um, mm -hmm. in any event, so that's our specialty. Yeah. So I want to talk about the, the specific strengths and weaknesses that exist among the products, because the, the, the this is sort of the thing where the whole debate sort of takes shape, right? Mm -hmm. So I, I don't know if we want to start on the whole life side, the universal life side, I don't think it matters. Um, Let's start on the, the whole life side just for Yeah, case. I was going to say that's logical probably. So the strengths are that it's it, it has higher guarantees. We know that. And there are certain things that are basically set in stone on behalf of the whole life product from day one that cannot ever be changed. Correct. And because of that, that most whole life hacks try to claim that their product is superior because it's built on a certain guarantee that is agreeably higher than what you can get almost anywhere else. Mm -hmm. um, no denying that. I mean, that's, that's sort of the mechanics there. We would, we would contend a little bit, though, that because of those guarantees, there, there, there is a trade-off. There is something that you give up by mm -hmm. virtue of having that. And what you're giving up, essentially is the potential for slightly higher gain 
um, which compounded over a large number of years could end up to be not an insignificant number. But ultimately, stability is the the key term to whole life insurance. Correct. Um, meanwhile, some of the criticism it has that it, it it has that it, 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 not to back up completely, but it does have that guaranteed column there. Right. And well, there's a guaranteed column on the universal. Yeah, but we don't want to talk about that because <laughs> it doesn't look so good. Um, a whole life on the guaranteed side of the ledger never falls apart. Um, as long as right. it's, as long as it's funded correctly and money's not pulled out and all those sorts. Of, I mean, there are there are things you can do to screw up all life so policy. Do me a really 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 important favor and remind me to go back to that point later on. Yeah. Um. So some of the criticisms that exist for whole life insurance is that it's it's rigid, it's obscure, it's the black box. You don't really know what's going on. Um, there's all of these these sort of it's just unpleasant and unagreeable kind of stuff. Unforgiving. Yeah. 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 Right. Um, Meaning, if you if you had a year where you couldn't pay your premium. All of your premium. You could lose your policy. You would lose your policy would lapse. Um, the problem is we come, we have great. a lot of people who come to us who who really think that. Yes, yes, we do. I mean, that's a that's a major concern, and I, and I'm not saying it's not a valid concern. It's certainly, you know, no one wants to pour a lot of money into something and then have it, you know, fall apart. But even the um, most poorly designed and implemented whole life insurance do not necessarily have that problem. Yeah, it's not a it it's not a certainty. No, at all, um, and I'm sure we're going to get into that. But well, we can right now. Obviously, we we blend every whole life policy we sell. Meaning what? And and we so we, what? we add term insurance to it, and that enables us to we don't add a, we don't add a supplemental term rider. We we add term insurance within the policy. Yes, yes. Um, well, it's sometimes considered a rider. It kind of depends on how the insurance company yeah. looks at, um, which enables us to reduce the whole life portion and fill that difference in with paid up additions, which are essentially extra money going into the policy. Mm -hmm. um, so that design lets us maximize cash value performance. It gives us much more immediate cash access. Um, and it also decreases the minimum that we actually have to pay each year, not lapse the policy. Correct. And so for all those reasons, we have a great degree of flexibility in the design so long as we do it correctly. Right. But even if we didn't do that, or even if we did, there are other options that exist on a policy year in and year out that will enable you to reduce or skip a premium if need be. Correct. Because that cash value that you have is a cash value that you have access to. Right. And if it needs to go towards paying a premium, it can do that. Right. And a lot of that, and a lot of those options depend on how long you've had the policy, how much cash value is in the policy. Right. I mean, there's factors there. It's not, it's not or cut and dry. If the policy is old enough, mm -hmm. it's also entirely possible to just use dividends to pay the premium. Mm. So the rigid, one, of, one of the biggest, <laughs> sorry, which is one of the biggest selling features of career agents when they're selling a, um, as I learned when they're selling a policy is to say, Hey, look, and on this projected now, we can't promise you this, but this projected uh, illustration here says that, you know, in 18 years, the dividend will be enough to pay the base premium. Mm -hmm. But guess how many phone calls people get 18 years later to let them know that the dividend is large enough to pay the base premium. Yeah. that is no. Zero. Never, never happens. Yep. So w you and I, and I'm just as a sidebar, but you and I encounter people all the time who, you know, say, God, you know, I've had this policy for, X number of years, and I'm really tired of paying the premium. To be clear, can we can we can I jump in and make a very very specific clarifying point? Most of those people bought whole life insurance specifically for death benefit purposes, yes. not yes. really for what we no 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 generally do. no not at all. Um, and and the policies have have come along, and and they're sort of wondering was this really a good deal or not a good deal? And and most of the time we look at those older policies, not all the time, but most of the time you go, eh, it's probably it's probably okay to leave it alone. Mm -hmm. Um, but if you're really tired of paying the premium, you know, if you, what was your, what was your, you know, do you have your annual statement from last year? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, what was your dividend? Well, it was X. 
one like, and a half times my premium. <laughs> like, exactly. Well, you just told me your premium was, I'm just pulling numbers, okay? You're, you just told me yep. your premium was $5,000, and you just told me your dividend was six and a half, so um, why don't you just call the company and say, hey, Let's let the dividend what take care is of that. Pay premium. <laughs> exactly. I want that one. Yeah, exactly. And you'll never have to. You'll you'll keep the life insurance in force, mm-hmm. and you don't have to pay the premiums anymore. Mm-hmm. Sounds like a good deal to me. Mm-hmm. Um, but it's something that, unfortunately, it's well, fortunately, it's a great feature of whole life insurance. Unfortunately, it goes to the poor servicing of policies that have been sold. Yes. Yes. Um. So one of the criticisms that exists that is true is the fact that there is a lot of obscurity. Um, the, the actual design, the actual assumptions, the actual expenses are all cloaked. Mm-hmm. And it's all considered proprietary information. Um, no one issuer of whole life insurance knows exactly how another one does it. And the ability to parse that information and reconcile it is virtually non-existent. Right. It's a black box. Yes. I've heard that so many times. So that is, that's one of the downsides. Mm-hmm. And I would tell you that's a downside that a lot of the, the hacks um, don't want to get into at all. Mm-hmm. Because in their eyes... You mean the people who are pro whole life insurance and hate everything about universal life insurance? Correct. Correct. I'm with you. I'm with you. Um, so if if you're talking to somebody who tends to be fairly detail oriented and you have to admit to them that, yeah, whole life insurance, um, how do how do we go back and actually make sure that I got paid the right dividend? Mm-hmm. We don't. Right. Um, and and that, that's just you do take a little leap of faith there. Um, that being said, I've never known of a circumstance where anybody has made a, a gross violation there. In terms of the dividend paid? Yes. Right. Yes. I mean, there's, several companies have been faced with lawsuits that say they, they, they withheld earnings and should have paid dividends. None of it is typically about whether or not they, they correctly calculated the dividend, and a lot of it has to do with insurance law about the amount of money that an insurer can actually retain and put towards surplus rather than pay out as a dividend. Right. Correct. And none of those cases have actually successfully been litigated. They all get settled because the insurer has the money and really doesn't want to go through the, the headache. And it's it's typically such a hair-splitting amount Everybody of money. Everybody gets their check for 75 cents. And yeah. <laughs> Exactly. The only one who wins is the attorney. That's yeah. that's the only one who wins in those cases. Yeah. I had that actually. I had that happen. I don't know if I ever told you that on a policy that I owned, um, some years ago. Mm-hmm. And uh, and I got the letter about it, and then you know, a few months later, I got my dollar and twenty five cents. Mm-hmm. Which I'm sure just got thrown in the trash or something. I have no idea. <laughs> like, you really think I'm going to go to the bank for dollar and twenty five cents? That's going to cost me more to the drive to the bank to, to put this in. <laughs> In the bank. Exactly. Uh, yeah. So that one, that one's pretty true. You want to jump on over to the universal life side now? Yeah, we can. I mean, I, I will Have add I like anything like that's no, I mean, I think that's a true, um, that last concern about the dividend calculating, you know, whether what was paid yeah. was actually it's true, but it's just, it's just not, I, I'm, I'm, I'm just reiterating. It's just, it, it's true, but it's not valid. So, and I mean, the we'll, danger there is so well, like a, we'll, 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 we'll address that on the universal life side too. It's true, but it's not really valid. Yeah. Okay. Because I mean, if you think about it, just, just think about it logically from a competitive standpoint. I mean, life insurance companies are not islands. No, they, they don't have a monopoly. No. So everybody has options. Mm hmm. Um, and that's, I and guess the I'll, minute word gets out that you, a, a, a criminal and, and you've decided that, yeah, that well, you're in the business of screwing your clients to make sure that uh, the CEO gets a nice pay package this year. We're going <laughs> to, we're going to take $5 from every policy holder right. and that'll, that'll do well. Right. Um, it's kind of like Congress going to destroy credibility pretty quickly. Yeah, exactly. 
Exactly. Okay. Yeah. So we'll talk about UL now. So or universal benefits. life, which is not use acronyms. I haven't at all. You do. I so I, stop it. It's all my fault. I mean, if you want, I but like I told you earlier today, I'm from Gen Y. I can make a big deal out of anything. So um, <laughs> you can whine about anything. <laughs> not a problem. Um. Uh, so universal life insurance. The the big benefit is flexibility. Mm-hmm. So there is no stated premium. There's just an amount that you have to pay each year that's based off expenses that are associated with a policy. And as long as those get covered, you're fine. Correct. Um, and then, of course, there's some additional flexibility when it comes to playing with the death benefit that actually exists in most whole life insurance circles now. It didn't used to, but those those benefits are benefit, um, which is done with universal life insurance to save on expenses. On whole life insurance, it doesn't really work that way. All it does is, is decrease the premium that's due, um, but it's still it's still doable. And so, if you find yourself in a situation where you've got more death benefit than perhaps you can afford, um, you've you've got that option on both sides. Right. The other the other stated benefit for universal life insurance is it it has a higher potential for yield um, theoretically. And it's much, much more open. And so it's commonly referred to as the unbundled product. And where whole life insurance is criticized for being cloaked in darkness, universal life insurance has a big, bright, shiny spotlight on it. Right. All, the, can, all of the expenses are disclosed and, mm-hmm. and that sort of thing. The actual, I mean, there, there's no difference between a universal life reserve and the cash surrender value like there could be on a whole life policy. And so when there's a stated rate of interest, it's going to be paid off the actual cash value that's on the Much easier to calculate that that number is correct. Yes. To verify on your own. Yes, yes. And you can see the, and, the actual uh, insurance charges. And furthermore, when it comes to indexed and, and even variable universal life insurance, um, you're, not, you're not tied to the whims of the insurance company. Mm-hmm. Um, when it comes to whole life insurance, regular whole life insurance, or participating whole life insurance with dividends, and even current assumption fixed universal life insurance, um, the, the declared rate is up to the company and what they think is reasonable based on their experience for the year. Um, when it comes to products like index universal life insurance and variable universal life insurance, that's kind of out of the hands of the insurer for a large degree. Right. Exactly. Because, it, well, they're contractually obligated to give you X. Mm-hmm. And if the index does X, then then they have to do that. Right. Or if the underlying sub accounts, the investments on a whole. Sure. Well, on a VU. Right, yeah. Very variable universal life policy happens. Um, then that, that stops that from taking place. Sure. Well, um, oh, go ahead. No, I was going to make a joke. On very variable universal, they're more than happy to do that they're making plenty of money either way so it doesn't matter <laughs> accumulate more money because that just makes our percentage go that two, up that two we're percent we're good <laughs> yeah. yeah yeah keep it up um so the the criticism the big criticism the boogeyman that exists for universal life insurance is the fact that very little is actually guaranteed mm-hmm. there is a minimum guaranteed interest rate yeah and there was a time when it used to be a decent number, like four or five percent. These days, it's actually dropped to as low as two or one percent in some cases. Right. Um, and the administrative and mortality charges are also not set in stone. Um, they can increase, and furthermore, the mortality expenses do increase on a regular schedule for to account for the 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 rising cost of mortality. They just they they spiral out of control. Right. <laughs> you, hear the, you hear the sarcasm in my voice. Yes, yes, I do. Um, so there's there's a bit of a, a split in this conversation to have when it comes to this specific topic. And the first one we'll, we'll address is just the rising cost of insurance because this is one that, that the unsuspecting and also nefarious whole life hacks will, will bring up. Mm-hmm. And the... The problem is it, it it's done under the the sort of in I don't know, it, it's 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 pushed out there with this sense that well because the the cost of insurance is going to increase 
every year without your ability to control it, it's going to become infinitely more expensive to own this death benefit, and that is going to destroy your policy. That's the argument, yes. Yes. And what's the truth? It doesn't happen. Why not? If. <laughs> if funded cor- if the policy is funded correctly. Okay. For universal life insurance, that rising cost of insurance exists. Yeah, let's talk, spend spend a few minutes. I want you to spend a cup just a couple. Let's not get too lost in the tall weeds, but let's let's talk about a little bit of the difference about how they compute the cost of insurance in a whole life contract versus a universal life contract. Remember that's when a, I told you Remember when I told you to remind me of something earlier? Yes. That was actually what I was going to talk about when you reminded me. Mm-hmm. So I'm but reminding we're you now. Yet. We're not there yet. Well, okay. <laughs> Unless you want to be there right now. I think it's important I think, before we talk individually about the, each oh. each product. That's why I was... We already started that. Um. Okay. So they are not any different. What do you mean? I mean that... The the expense that is assumed to put a million dollars of death benefit coverage on, on a person doesn't matter if it's whole life insurance or universal life insurance or even term insurance. You mean people don't die? It's not more expensive for people to die when they own a universal life insurance? No. And there's no magic pill that the whole life company owns that just makes that go away. <laughs> so the assumptions are... The only the difference same. is how they calculate it, right? The expense, no. how they, well, I mean, how they spread the expense over time, correct? Or am I wrong? Uh, on that? Not even, no. Because is my, there's, is my, is my art, I'm, I, I know I understand this, but I'm just saying my, uh, my explanation is not, is not spot on probably. Right. Because even whole, let's see that this is, this is sort of another myth that we sort of missed when it came to whole life insurance. So there's lots of people who will play up whole life insurance and tell you that whole life insurance has no surrender charge. Correct. Um, the cash surrender value is the, is always the cash surrender value. The truth of the matter is there's a surrender charge. They just don't state it. Right. In other words, there's more cash there, technically in a whole life. Yeah, if policy. there wasn't a surrender charge, your cash value would be equal to. And there is a, a implicit, um, uh, excuse me, surrender charge that's going on as the insurer has amortized its expenses the same way uh, uh, like they do with universal life insurance. Right. Um, now to be clear to the people who have asked us in the past, does, does that mean that I actually don't get the cash? No, no, no. The cash that's in the po- that's on that ledger is, is yours. And in truth, there's a, an easier way to, to accumulate cash on a whole life policy in the first couple of years because universal life insurance will use that surrender charge in a way that's a little abusive in my opinion. Um, but it just, it is what it is. Um, so in other words, if if the surrender charge is 10% of cash value and you dump an extra $10,000 in there, it's going to apply to that regardless. Um, so even though they didn't actually incur that expense to get that extra money, they're still going to pretend like it, right. it happened. They're still holding it hostage. Yes. Um, so the expense process, the building of the policy is absolutely no different. It's identical no matter what. And so the only thing that makes whole life insurance more quote unquote stable is the fact that whole life insurance requires that you actually put the money in there. I'm going to build the reserve and the expense is going to take place. It actually, they they actually require you to put more money than it, than, than you should. I'm, I'm, I'm going to frame this in a way I think that, that people can understand in layman's terms. They require you to put more money in the policy than you actually should have to. Right. In the earlier years, when your when your mortality is less, the chance of you dying is much less. Yes. Um, And they and whereas universal life insurance lets you do that if you want to, but it's not a requirement. Right. Which is why it artificially looks less expensive. Yes. And back and, and, and we should we should back up and note that you know that there's all the horror stories about the universal life policies that fell apart that were issued in the eighties. The truth is it's really not that many. And we know it's not that many because if, if there was a wholesale event where all of these universal life policies issued by every insurer from nineteen seventy nine up until today was headed down to an implosion, we would have a a just nasty consumer outcry. Yes. That the, the FCC would be all over this. 
um, because insurers have a lot of money and attorneys love to sue insurers because <laughs> they have a lot of money. Right. And so if, if there was, if there was a real story to make out of this, besides if it bleeds, it leads in the media, then you bet that every good trial attorney out there would already be on it. Sure. Um, so the, the, but what took place was the fact that lots of agents were trying to sell universal life insurance as a cheap alternative to whole life insurance because they could use inflated interest rates to assume much lower required premiums. Mm -hmm. And so that's what they did, and it worked out pretty well for a while. But then when interest rates halved and then halved again, it, uh, it didn't work. Right. Because those really, really super low, like almost getting it for free premiums that were assumed were not sustainable when interest rates went from 15% down to 3 Exactly. It caused a little problem. Yes. So that's that's where that discussion comes in, and that's where it 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 takes. But the fact of the matter is, if it's designed correctly, and what I mean by that is, take the universal life death benefit, take a whole life death benefit, compare the premium, and make sure the universal life insurance is at least equal. Right. So, in other words, if if you've got Bob and Tom, and Bob's going to buy whole life insurance, and Tom's going to buy universal life insurance, and they're both going to buy five hundred thousand dollars worth of coverage and they're exactly the same age mm -hmm. then tom should be funding his universal life insurance at exactly the same premium that's required for tom to for bob or I, i've lost track bob, bob for bob, <laughs> for bob to, to buy his whole life insurance policy. right yep yes yes and if any agent goes to to bob afterwards and says bob i got tom this policy for like five hundred dollars less than you're paying you should buy my policy that agent is a jerk <laughs> Because he's assuming that everything's going to stay equal always, and yeah, yeah it's going to work out in your favor, mm -hmm. which is a big risk to take. Because right. at some point, you might get a letter from the insurance company and it says, hey, Tom, we know you've been paying that premium for the past 25 years, but... Uh, that was $500 less than you should have been. Yeah, and there's not now enough cash like value. There's not enough cash now value in there anymore to help offset that, so uh, we want you to come up with, you know, some extra money? Think of it this way. It's kind of like saying, hey, Tom, you've been paying this this premium on this death benefit for the last 20 years at a $500 discount. We'd now like you to go back and make up that difference. And we don't mean 500 times 20. We mean 500 compounded by a certain interest rate <laughs> right. for the past 20 years. That, that's the difference. That's what we Right, need. right, exactly. Um, so that's a problem. And yes. that's, that's what has gotten Universal Life Insurance to get a couple of the, the criticisms that it's had against it. In truth, there are many policies that were issued way back it's, when. It's really, it's really poor sales tactics, in other words. Yes, they were issued perfectly correctly, and they're just fine. Yeah, I've, seen, I've is, seen some. I've seen some that have some, some of those 5% guarantees and stuff. Yeah. <laughs> they're they're, and the truth they're is, humming they're, along just fine. <laughs> there's a number of those policies that even designed badly didn't do that badly. Right, right. So it's, it's stated. Right. The other, th the other piece to this is there's, there's many agents that will go, well, look at the guaranteed column. Because the guaranteed column says this policy falls apart in year 65. And we're referring to universal life insurance again. Yes, yeah. universal life. And um, it, uh, it, it, it's the suggestion that on the whole life side, that doesn't happen. On the universal life insurance side, it doesn't matter. You, you can put all that money in there. It still says it's not going to, it's, you're going to lose all your money. Um, the truth behind that is that that assumption is that the, the lowest possible interest is paid. And so they the dropped highest, it to the guaranteed, the, the lowest guaranteed rate. And that the highest possible charges for both insurance coverage and administrative charges is being charged. Right. And the truth is it's never happened. Nope. And the other truth is insurers cannot just suddenly decide we're not making enough money on this so let's increase the cost of insurance <laughs> yeah. we, we're gonna say that we had to spend more money on paper clips this year in order to do that they actually have to get regulatory approval it's just like the rate increases that we see taking place for long-term care insurance right insurers actually have to prove that their mortality experience their claims experience was higher than anticipated. And I don't just mean like from February to March it was higher. I mean they have to go back and prove that this is a systemic issue. They On an entire block of business. Yes. This yeah. is this is a systemic issue that we underpriced the, 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 
the cost of insuring these people, and it's only going to get worse. Right. And at that point, they can increase it. Right. If they can't prove that, then they're not increasing the charge. They, they have to be able to actuarially substantiate. Furthermore, yeah. Furthermore, historically, the evidence has been that when audited, it most insurers have been found to have overassumed the expense, which is not uncommon. And in order to compensate for that, they return that additional expense to the insured through a interest bonus. Right. They can't just willy nilly raise the cost. No. Because they want to. Because and, the CEO says, ah, I think I'd like to have a new Bentley this year. Yeah. And those those oil changes are expensive. So let's get this one up. <laughs> Three thousand dollars a pop. Um. So. The the suggestion that your universal life policy is just going to whip off in some other direction and totally take you for a ride is it, it's it's true. Well, it's it's theoretically possible, but it's not valid. Right. It's never happened. We know of no one who has done it. Um, and we'd also contend that anybody that did it would basically be signing off on their agreement to never, ever, ever play in that field ever again exactly because they would not they, they wouldn't come back from that no if one of the major universal life players decided yep we're gonna we're gonna take a sharp increase to mortality charges it, they're done yeah because all of their competitors and all of the whole life guys are gonna have a field day with that and i mean going back to your point to to justify an increase in the uh, on the insurance side of the mm -hmm. of the house Mm -hmm. I mean, you would have to have a, an increased mortality experience over an extended period of time. Yeah. And it would have to deplete reserves to the point that that they could justify that increase. Right. The insurer has to go and say, listen, if this keeps up, we're, I mean, we, we don't have money. Right. And going back to the point I think we've made public before, which is um, if that happens, you probably got bigger problems <laughs> right. in the world. I mean, we're talking well, about global Let's let's go back. Let's go back. We we already said that that there's no difference in terms of the pricing that takes place for universal life insurance versus whole life insurance. Whole life just because you issue a whole life insurance policy doesn't mean that all of a sudden magically the policy's cheaper. Um, so the things that could affect a a issuer of universal life insurance to say, wow, um, people are dying much more often than we thought, um, is probably something that could be a systemic issue, like an influenza outbreck, right? Or, weird infectious disease thing right and it's probably not going to be isolated or something right. really weird it's not going to be isolated to one insurer and just because the whole life company says yeah we guarantee we're going to draw a line in the sand and we're not going to go any further than this um that doesn't mean that they're they're there's some magic bullet that lets them go okay after we've spent that much money we're done right they don't get to to just like wave their hands at the magic fairy and go give us the money that we need to back up the guarantee exactly it's the same. It, 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 the same problems exist on both sides. Yes. Theor but this is so. I mean, this is so. This is like hyper theoretical stuff. Yes. That that salespeople use to scare <laughs> to scare people. Well, no, no, no. It's not hyper theoretical, right? Because most of the time, the tactic is you. Depending on which product you want to hack, excuse me, hawk. Um, you just <laughs> or hack you, whatever. Um, <laughs> uh, <laughs> and you just um, come up with with crazy emotive sort of pitches right. to people. Exactly. That's exactly right. Like, oh, that whole life insurance, the black box, it's going to ride, and it's all super rigid, and if you can't pay your premium in year 10, you're going to lose your coverage. <laughs> or, oh, universal life insurance, that takes the sure out of insurance. <laughs> That's a, I never heard that one before. Yeah, that was some terrible article. I'm going to have to use that. <laughs> yeah. Some, I can't remember his name. That's funny. But there, there, there is no. It doesn't make any difference. And so the the plan of attack is less about which one's going to fall apart. Neither one will. It's more about what do I want to do, and do I get more benefit out of one versus the other? Right. That's that's what it comes down to. Taking notes. Yep. Inspired. Blown away. <laughs> All of the above. Nothing else to say. I'm writing this down. I was still taking the note on it takes a sure out of insurance. 
Oh. I'm writing that down. <laughs> Got to use that. <laughs> That's a good one. Uh, well, if you use that with anyone we talk to, I will slap you. Uh, no, I'm just kidding. Could be the title. Uh, of, could be the title of our podcast. Yeah, yeah. We already did that though. I know. Uh, so I, I um. Yeah. So missing? which one is better? Let's wrap it up. Which one which is better? better? Neither one. Exactly. And this is this is why comparing is important. Yes, no. Yes, maybe. absolutely. And that's why taking all the variables into consideration, making sure, I mean, we do our very best to put everything on a level playing field. Mm -hmm. That's our goal. Mm -hmm. I mean, we always tell people that we put everything on a level playing field. We send it to them. We let them look at it and form their own opinions. Mm -hmm. It's a kind of a funny thing because people will come to us and they'll be from one camp or the other and we'll show them the other product and they'll be like, well, da, 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 what's this? And, um, my comment is always, I, I, I have, I'm not dedicated to either one. I, I, I really, I think, well, either way. So here's, here's what the other one looks like so you can see it. Right. And that has, that's gone against us, right? Like there are times that people will just fall into analysis paralysis and it's like, but, but we don't hear from them again because they're like, sure, I can't, I can't decide. Right. Um, but I've always been of the opinion that I'd rather you know these things and um, I was told a long time ago that there's like five words you never want to hear mm -hmm. a client say, and those are, you never told me that. Right. Um, and so if, if you come in telling me I want whole life insurance or I, I want universal life insurance and I just show you one and we never talk about the other one and then something comes up a year later where it's like, well, I mean, would, that, would that have worked? And I go, oh, well, you never asked me about that. Um, I'm the ass in that case, not you. <laughs> Exactly. Yep. It's just it's just a matter of doing the comparison, looking at the numbers, and understanding what it is you're trying to. I mean, that's one of the first questions we always ask people. What is it that you're... We can take all the facts, right? The facts are great. We have to have mm -hmm. those to, to, to break down our analysis. But one of the first things we always want to know is, what are you trying to accomplish? Mm -hmm. Because then that tells us, okay this is in or this is out or maybe everything's on the table. We don't know. But, mm -hmm. but when, when you give us that, you know, that the goal, what is it that you're trying to accomplish? It makes it so much more efficient. We can, we can design things in such more, so much more of an efficient way for you, mm -hmm. um, based on the products that are available. Mm-hmm. As opposed to, oh, you only want this because this is the. Don't worry about the other ones. Don't don't listen to the details. That's that. You don't listen to that. This is this is the best one that's going. Right. The we only one that's worth it. I don't build them. <laughs> well, uh, and that's pretty much it. Yep, I think we've done all we can do this week. So, in the fight of whole life insurance versus universal life insurance. It, unfortunately, for those looking for a winner, ends in a tie. Yes, I would agree. So I am Brandon Roberts. And I'm Brantley Whitley. And we will see you next week. <laughs>